Today, I thought I'd share some of the things that I've come across when working with development teams and testing applications and give you some of the best practices that help you avoid the OWASP top 10 risks. Now, we'll talk about some of the common mistakes that I've encountered and hopefully you'll get some useful insights into building and maintaining secure web applications. As always, if you enjoy the video, then don't forget to like and subscribe and let's dive in. So we're not going to start out with input validation and sanitization because that's what everyone throws out at the start of any kind of security control conversation or interview and it's so boring. So let's talk about authentication first. Now, with our continued reliance on legacy security controls like passwords, we continue to have issues like broken authentication. For example, we have credential stuffing, default or weak passwords, simple brute force attacks, and maybe even recovery questions like what city you were born in or what is your favorite food? And I'm pretty sure that's how my old MS account was broken into but don't worry if you don't remember what MSN Messenger is. So how do we address these issues? Well first up we can just stop using outdated authentication mechanisms but most organizations aren't open to this idea so we have the band-aid solution of simply adding multi-factor authentication on top which does combat some of these issues pretty well but there are a bunch of gotchas that we need to look out for. So first up if you're just adding push notifications, like I've seen with many enterprise applications, spamming users with push notifications is a good way to get in. And note here that I'm kind of going on a tangent and talking about enterprise apps rather than applications consumed by customers externally. And there are some differences in how we design and build these applications because the constraints or requirements of our end users are a little bit different, but we'll be here all day if we go down that rabbit hole. So. Anyway, probably some of the users you just spammed will email someone in IT saying that their phone just sent them hundreds of approved login from new location requests or push notifications. But by that time, you've probably also tricked about a thousand users and have plenty of access already. And this example comes from personal experience on previous pen tests. I'm not just making it up. Users do literally just press yes to make alerts go away. So this means that relying on push notifications as a second factor when you're using usernames and passwords it's probably not worth the effort that it takes to implement and try to use a one-time code that actually needs to be entered and that leads us to the second point if you're using four or six digit codes and you're not protecting against brute force attacks then once again you're wasting your time so that's something to consider i've seen a lot of web apps add multi-factor authentication in the form of a pin number or just characters but the endpoint itself can be brute forced and hey once again a useless control and generally speaking we see these issues when a decision has been made about security without any kind of threat modeling or clear idea of what we're actually trying to protect against so make sure that when you're making decisions on something that you're going to implement then you have a clear idea of what the control is for otherwise it'll appear and not do the job that you assumed it would do now, I wish that was all there was to it, but we didn't even touch on session management yet. So if you want to see a deep dive video on how to design and build authentication mechanisms that scale, then let us know down in the comments below and we can go deeper. But for now, let's move on to the next item in our list. Bridge the gap between classroom learning and real world cybersecurity with TCM Security Academy. Our curriculum is designed for action, giving you the tools to tackle and resolve real cybersecurity challenges. Prepare to step confidently into the cyber frontline. Join us at academy.tcm-sec.com and turn learning into doing. So our next item is keeping our dependencies up to date. And this is a challenge in larger or more complex applications or organizations with larger code bases, but this generally combats issues like CVs for outdated components. Now, if we just think about this superficially, we might think, ah, we can just use SBOM and monitor our libraries and tool to check our dependencies and everything will be fine. But the reality is that this process is more time consuming 
consuming than it sounds unless you have a relatively small code base and enough resources to deal with verbose outputs and potentially breaking changes. So how do we deal with this problem? We put in a tool, we get pull requests every time there's an update, and now we have 500 pull requests 24 hours later to review. The only real way to deal with this is to prioritize and dedicate a set amount of resources, but on a regular basis, rather than just saying you need to fix all of these every time something pops up. And at the very least, this will stop your team from dreading coming into work or signing into work and just cutting corners entirely. Prioritize your packages or libraries and dedicate a suitable amount of time, be it one hour a day or one hour a week, and make sure to recognize work that consistently prevents fires, not just the work that puts them out. I'd also recommend finding a solution that gives some kind of feedback in terms of the severity of findings, because most package updates are not for critical CVs, but occasionally things like log for shell do drop. So break it down into what you actually need to do, make it part of your team's workflow, and don't try to do everything all at once. Marathon and not a sprint and all of that jazz. So next up, let's look at authorization, basically what you're allowed to do as a user or some kind of entity within a system. And this relates to broken access control that sits at the top of the OWASP top 10. So the easiest and most widely known vulnerability here is IDOR, Insecure Direct Object Reference. And you can basically change an object's ID, like a user ID, and then you can fetch data for the object you specified. So if my user ID is 55 and I change the request for to 56, then I get the information of user 56. And we also have other issues like unprotected protected API endpoints and misconfigured roles. And generally speaking, these issues do have a huge impact on web applications. So what are some of the best practices to help avoid that or at least minimize the issues like IDOR creeping into our applications? Well, one big thing that I've noticed working closely with development teams over the years is that there is often a lack of clear roles or some kind of access control matrix. We just have a user story and then we build that feature and then we don't think about that role within the wider context of the application or how other roles might interact with this new feature. And so potentially functional is being added and not all functionality is being considered. So keeping clear documentation on roles rather than leaving it to assumptions is really an important step. And we can also think about some principles like deny by default. So if we add a new feature, we allow an entity with a specific role to interact with that feature explicitly, and then we deny everyone else by default until once again, we decide that that specific role or entity should be able to access it. So another approach is to also consider record ownership within in a model. So for user models, only that user can carry out CRUD operations on their record. And you might have some exceptions to this. So for example, if we have administrators, but that's an explicit exception rather than users being able to, by default, read, update or delete any record. And this is an interesting mindset shift when it comes to designing applications. But anyway, let's keep moving on. Every time I conduct an interview, and ask how to prevent injection attacks like SQLi or cross-site scripting, I get input sanitization and validation thrown back at me. And whilst this is part of the prevention for these issues, it's not the whole picture. At the very least, we need to be thinking about escaping output and also using things like parameterized queries over dynamic queries. And generally speaking, input validation only stops some attacks. And in cases where it's poorly implemented, it doesn't stop anything at all. So although these days, things like input validation have become better and we have more information and guidelines to share and follow and libraries that do the heavy lifting for us, we need to think about using allow lists over block lists whenever possible. It's a good practice to follow in this area. And if you've been to my live classes, I've shared quite a few stories and situations where a team has used a block list and not been able to account for every possibility. And so generally speaking, explicitly allowing, just like in our access controls, is a more secure approach. 
Obviously, modern day frameworks and libraries provide a lot of well-tested functionality. So instead of writing your own functions to escape output, for example, then use what the framework provides and make sure you read the documentation though and that you're using it in the way it's intended to be used or it's designed to be used. Because if you're forcing some weird edge case, then you're likely breaking something and you might need to consider an alternative approach. And I've seen this a few times with templating engines when they're being used in unintended ways and that has led to vulnerabilities. So instead of saying, hey, input validation and we're good, think about validation, then sanitization and then escaping. Finally, before we wrap up this video, let's talk about security headers. Not the most exciting topic in the world, but an easy way to add protection to your web application and for some reason often neglect it. I like the way they are described in Tanya Yanka's book, Alison Bob Learn Web Application Security. It's worth a read if you're working as part of a dev team or doing anything AppSec related during the development life cycle. And it says security headers are like seatbelts for your web application. And things like CSP, content security policy, can help us prevent cross-site scripting, assuming that we can't bypass it, which we could do a video on CSP bypasses if you want let us know down in the comments below and things like x-frame options can prevent things like click jacking so my advice here is to go read up on security headers add them to your web application and simply enjoy the benefits of better security there is one small caveat though and that is adding security headers can change the behavior of your web application and you need to make sure that you didn't break anything once they're switched on but otherwise once they're on, you're good to go. Now, there are five more things that I wanted to cover, which are securing sensitive data, avoiding misconfigurations, monitoring logging, API best practices, and testing early and often. But I ran out of time when making this video. So if you liked it and want to see more of this kind of content and on those topics that I've just mentioned or other related topics, then once again, let me know down in the comments below and I'll be sure to make a follow-up video. Otherwise, I will catch you next time.